picture three men. They are beyond sight or healthy diet. Isolated by a virus, they decide to turn to old TV for solace. Will they find comfort? Or will they find the Twilight Zone? Zone. Welcome to the Twilight Zone Zone, episode number 10, actually. I can't believe we're getting this deep into it. I guess it lets you know how uh, overwhelming this has been for all of us. We're doing two episodes tonight. Uh, one is one that I think we have all at least seen allusions to, and one that is a solid episode and might end up with a difference of opinion, but has an incredible cast. We're doing The Grave from 1961 and it's a good life from 1961 now um of course i have my normal droogs on the panel matt hey everyone i just put out a novella sorry a print version of my novella son of grendel if you want to see counterinsurgency and people going crazy in the woods and daniel hello this is daniel a frequent contributor to poptos and I've been thinking bad thoughts the whole time. For those of you who saw the title, hopefully that made sense to you and you didn't sound like something weird and pervy. Um, episode number plenty one. of weird and pervy stuff already. I think that's par for the course. That's fair. At this point, uh, yeah. So the first episode to me is kind of a weirdly different one. And even if you like it better than the other one, it's just a very far departure, it seems to me, than most. Uh, but then we're doing The Grave, number one, uh, which has an incredible cast. Um, I'll give the opening narration, as is traditional. But note, uh, I've been playing a game which you should, after the first season, called Spot Rod Serling. Uh, this time, Rod Serling emerges from a bathroom in the middle of the scene uh, after they shoot a bunch of people. Or a bunch of people shoot one man. Uh, so Honestly, there you go. this is one of my personal favorite Rod Serling introductions. Yeah, Just Rod him Serling walking out in that suit. In what is a cowboy period piece, it's worth mentioning. So yes. everyone else is in full period regalia, and he comes out in his standard kind of uh, black wool pressed suit, full of happiness. And by the by, this one kind of requires a quote from a person. He, You know, the guy goes, he's dead, he's dead. And then Rod Serling comes out and goes, well, actually, uh, normally... The old man would be correct. This would be the end of the story. We've had a traditional shootout on the streets, and the bad man will soon be dead. But some men of legend and folktale have been known to continue having their way even after death. The outlaw and killer Pinto Sykes was such a person. And shortly we'll see how he introduces the town and a man named Connie Miller, in particular, to the Twilight Zone. Not bad. I mean, again, for a Western, this is pretty good. Well, that's the weird thing about this episode, though. It feels like it's from a different show because it's a Western. I mean, this could have been, a, I don't know, a Rawhide episode. Well, I kept expecting it to be a man out of time kind of a thing. Like, they've done that before. Like, there's one we even did here. Even though it was, you know, the 1961 or whatever it was supposed to come out. It was like an old man stumbling across. It's the one where the, the guy was the devil, right? In the, in the prison cell. But, like, these monks are out of the 15th century... And he's just an American who kind of stumbles across while traveling through Europe. That's kind of what I expected this to be. But no, it's just a flat-out Western with a woman doing the best and worst drunk acting I've ever seen. She reminded me a lot of, um, who's in The Hateful Eight? Uh, Jennifer Jason Lee. Yes. Um, okay, yeah. Was, yeah, the outlaw was the same was character. She was cute in a kind of spooky way. Yeah, definitely if it was made today, it'd be Helena Botham Carter. Uh, that's that's Matt's type, by the way. Thing. Cute in a spooky way. Hold on, Botham Carter. She's yeah. old enough to be my mom. <laughs> also Matt's type. I'm going to stop this bit. You, you know, she did movies when she was your age. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, The Grave, the lead is Lee Marvin. For those of you who don't know Lee Marvin, you know Lee Marvin. Gravel-voiced, uh, Dirty Dozen, like... <laughs> I don't know, Cat Baloo. World War II, he was like a serviceman, won a million awards. Like if you go to his Wikipedia page, he won a Commendation Medal for the Navy, Purple Heart, Combat Action Ribbon, Presidential Unit Citation. Like he has like a, like a breastplate filled with medals 
And he just has this kind of chiseled, hard scrabble voice. It's amazing. He's the best. And then, I mean, with that hard scrabble chest full of medals, then he would play that guy as the colonel in every World War II picture you can imagine. He must have never had an ounce of PTSD in him because he relived all of his battles in various forms. And then he started with Chuck Norris uh, towards the end of his career. He looks like the American version of Benedict Cumberbatch. But that, like, you're not wrong. <laughs> but I mean, like, again, just just look him up. Like, and you'll be like, you will recognize his face from things you've never seen. Like, oh, this is a picture from the Virginian. And I'm pretty sure I've seen this episode. You haven't seen this episode. It just, he's in everything. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it in Welcome to Night Vale, that's who they're always celebrating the 29th <laughs> or 30th birthday of. His, he turned 30 that day. And the joke, of ah, course, yes. is that he turned 30 in 1954 or something. And he's also been dead for like 40 years or uh, 30 some odd years. Like he died in the late he, 80s. He's been dead forever. He died in 87 at the age of 63. So there you go. I mean, so yeah, it, he, the long running joke is 30 year old Lee Marvin. Although I'm pretty sure by the age of 30, uh, when he was 54, like he was not only the biggest man on the planet, which I guess he was. Yeah, so this is the same year. That would be the year that uh, Big Heat came out, the Fritz Lang movie, and the Wild One with Marlon Brando, and the Kane Mutiny was the next year, 54. So, like, it's it's hard to get bigger. And uh, Bad Day for Black Rock in 55. I personally I really bigger. liked him in The Killers. Oh, he's great in The Killers. Of course he's great in The Killers. So he's playing a hard scrabble. Uh, he's one of those like wall-to-wall traveling sheriffs that you hear about in the Old West. And his name um, is Connie. I will say also surprise performance here by an underutilized Van Cleef. Lee Van Cleef from The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly is, of course, what I know him for, among mm. other things. Oh, he was um, in a ton of stuff, but yeah. And, of course, a previous movie uh, or previous episode, Escape from New York he's in as well he he was also in high noon he was he 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 has the face the like kind of squint into the sun grizzly like tanned face that you'd expect in the in an outlaw um and he plays that role very well uh and then there's just a bunch of you know actors who did some things here or there uh, but those were the so two the cast in this me in this episode is amazing yeah it is. is what we're getting yeah. at down the line we have the chief <laughs> The bartender is the chief from the Batman movies and stuff. And like they, they put money into actually filling out this cast, which is kind of nice. Um, Wait, Pat Hingle was in this? No, 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 no. The, the TV show, the 60s show. Oh, okay. That the makes Sheriff sense. O'Malley or O'Hurlihy <laughs> or whatever uh, Irish name they gave him because he's a police officer, so he has to be an Irishman. Um, and then we have our classic old prospector, William Challey. As we mentioned before, this is a kind of, I guess, classic Twilight Zone episode, which is why we're doing it. But this is does not feel the same way as a classic Twilight Zone episode. It was written by a guy named Montgomery Pittman and directed by Montgomery Pittman, who you probably have not heard of. But he does a lot of Westerns, as it will not surprise you, uh, including Maverick, uh, the show, not the movie, um, and The Lawman, the show, not the movie, and The Rifleman, the show, not the movie, and Cheyenne, the show, not the movie. This is right around the time when Sam Peckinpah was doing a bunch of TV shows. I am surprised that he didn't do this because it feels so much like a Peckinpah movie. I'd go a step further and say that Pittman and Peckinpah were at, like nemeses. And so they're like, you hired that Pittman, huh? Well, I'm not doing your show now. And they just walked away. Uh, so we can get into this episode a little bit. Matt, you want to give us a synopsis? Okay, so it starts out where the, you have a bunch of people taking ambush positions around the town and waiting for this guy to come out of a saloon. And he's all in black with a black hat. This being the sixties, you know, that's bad. And they order him to surrender. He goes for his gun and they ventilate him. Yeah, that's right. And uh, so an outlaw is dealt with. And then the guy who's been hunting him shows up and everyone's like, starts kind of hinting that maybe he was not trying to catch him too hard. And he progressively loses it throughout the episode. Mm-hmm. And meanwhile, his the outlaw's spooky but cute sister shows up and is spooky. And cute, apparently. <laughs> yeah, well, what nice. also happens is Connie, that's Lee Marvin, was a lawman who was apparently trying to track down Pinto, 
which is the person that was shot at the beginning, everyone's like daring him to go visit the grave because apparently Pinto put a curse on him, which said, oh, if you visit my grave, I'll reach up and pull you down into hell. And so they're daring him and like betting him a lot of money to get him to go do that and accusing him of being a coward when at first he doesn't. Yeah, 20 bucks in nine, in like 1880 is probably worth quite a lot today. Yeah, I mean, and and, and that's kind of what it is. Like, I was going to say, it's, it's a few scenes, but like, it's a very tight scene. Like, we start out with him returning to the bar. Um, everyone's kind of, you know, ebullient because the dude's dead and they all killed him. Although the story starts to fall apart immediately, it, it's kind of how do I put this? It's it's interesting because of the way that they show the breakdown of this, like the story, right? Like it's it starts out like a cowboy story, like Matt said. They ambush this guy who we find out has been kind of extorting the whole town. Everything is rough, everything is tense, and so they shoot him down. Then, um, you know, a well, then it becomes a chamber very- drama. Right. That uh, takes place in the bar. After that, the, he goes like, well, actually, all eight of us shot, but only one bullet hit. I wonder who hit him. And I'm like, well, that's a very specific thing. You'd think that if this was a Twilight Zone episode, then the people who were involved in the shooting would start dying one by one. Right? Like, that's what I thought would happen. But it turns out that that doesn't matter. The fact that only one of them actually hit and the bullet went right through his heart and blah, 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 blah. And Connie is just kind of like, well, why are you telling me this? Well, he was alive for half an hour and he mentioned you. No, right? right? Well, there's I mean, that whole scene where um, uh, Connie accuses Pinto of lying about waiting for him in Albuquerque. Right. And apparently, I guess, Connie didn't take that left turn in Albuquerque, so he never found Pinto. Right, exactly. I'm proud of that reference. But yeah, I mean, th- this episode progresses as you'd expect it would be. Like Matt mentioned, everyone puts money down. Uh, a 20 gold sovereign or sorry that, that'd be <laughs> james bond nonsense um a 20 dollar piece gold piece uh that connie can't go out to the grave and prove that he went all the way to the grave and no one wants to go with him because they're afraid because it's a spooky graveyard at midnight so he takes the bartender's bowie knife which i guess was part of your standard bar kit in the late 19th century and he says, look, just put this within five feet of the grave and then come back and tomorrow we'll check that you did that in the, you know, the, the naked light of day. And after that, the money's yours. Yeah. The 20 gold pieces or whatever it is. The doubloons or whatever nonsense they're talking about. Then uh, we have a very bizarre scene. Uh, Lee Marvin goes to the haunted house. <laughs> yeah, basically. Um, well, it's the cheap looking graveyard which meant it was perfect for a western that was being made at this time oh i know like he flat out walks onto the like the backs the like the back lot tour of the haunted mansion at disney world like it's just a weird rolling hillside and like um and there's a fan just off screen that's simulating wind and he is being flung around like it is crazy right like and then the it, it, someone left, I guess the groundskeeper left open like the uh, tool cage, like, and that door's flapping, and he nearly shits himself. It's something. Um, we should also mention that Matt's favorite sexy sister has bought a bottle of rye and just went a whole graveyard drinking. <laughs> has like finished two thirds of this bottle, which is awesome. And this is where her drunk acting comes in, which is great. Oh, yeah. That that sister, Ira, was real underrated and underutilized, I, I think. Own. Yeah, I whatever her name was. Ione. Uh, yeah, yeah, Ione. She, that's right. She's really... I mean, and again, like, like kind of Matt was alluding to, uh, she plays this uh, kind of creepy, unsettling type. She giggles. Uh, and in particular, her drunk laugh is just something. Yeah, she's basically uh, as close to you can get to a goth in the old west. Right. Um, you know, she's wearing her kind of mourning veil for her brother, even though like her and Pa don't particularly like the brother much. 
and um, she drinks an entire bottle of whiskey and is stumbling drunk, and she kind of goes this, ah, ha, 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 ha. or as we call it, Nick uh, Tuesday. That's right. So you dress in mourning widow's clothing, Daniel, and drink excessively? Don't you judge how I live my life. <laughs> Thanks for explaining the joke, man. But yeah, no, and, and she kind of stumbles around out of frame. And then the next morning, the townsfolk realize that Connie hasn't returned. They run into her holding a little, like, a plate, and she goes, This was the plate that he ate off of when he was a child. <laughs> I got a little crypt keeper but you get it. Uh, you know what would have worked really well in this episode is that guy from Will the Real Martian Please Stand Up. Which you know, one? that old random coot. Yes, 100%. Like, because there isn't even, there's even an old coot in the bar that would be, like, better played by him. Like, just, oh, he should have been Pa or something. Like, the sister's fine, but, the, like, make her less crazy. Keep her character slightly in frame, right? And then just had this old coot going, now, you know, he, he, he had a vendetta against you, Connie. <laughs> so so, so he, should be, he should be crazy Ralph from Friday the 13th. Why not? Why not? Um, although like 20% ra- less rapey than, than crazy Ralph. Because Ralph was just grabbing them girls. That's just not okay. Have we uh, gotten to what actually happens at the end of this? Don't oh, think God. So. Hey, go ahead, Daniel. Well, he goes to the grave, s- sticks the knife in it, and is like, I can't remember if he like yells at the guy for lying about him or if he's just silent, but either way, the ending's the same. He stabs the knife into the fresh dirt of the grave, he gets to stand up, and then suddenly he's pulled back down, and we cut to the next morning. Well, also, it is worth noting, he stabs the grave pulls it out and looks at the blade and my only interpretation was for that scene was he expected there to be blood on the knife um makes sense he looks at that knife and i'm like that's a touch uh and again maybe it's lee marvin just making acting decisions in a script that is very thin um well i imagine if lee marvin told you to do something you had to do it well I mean, yeah, especially if you're an annoying guitar player in the bar. Oh, what's that guy's name? It's something Rod. Like, like, whatever. It, it's really not worth mentioning. Uh, Johnny Rob. It's some, but they give him a nickname like Lying Johnny or something. Uh, but there's only diegetic mu- uh, music in this, and it's Johnny Rob playing his guitar, and he's a coward, and he's like a blabbermouth, and he's just—it's nonsense. It's all nonsense cliches. But yeah, anyway, he stabs the grave, the knife comes out clean, he stabs it a second time, and again, because he's cocky, he makes a mistake here. He was only told that he had to be within five feet of the grave. Throw the knife down and walk away, you did it. I think that says a lot about his character. He wasn't just going to do the bare minimum, especially after he was insulted and called a coward. He was going to say, motherfucker, I'm putting the knife on the grave. Well, then you know what you do? You stab it the first time. You're not stabbing him to death, man. Like, I mean, I will say, too, if you, I guess you're right. It feels like it's a different show. Had it not been the Twilight Zone and had this been like a weird episode of Bonanza, mm. it would have been fantastic. Because like, oh, I had this been like Zone. a Halloween special of Bonanza, it would have made perfect sense. Well, or, or like even like how the X-Files sometimes did an episode where it really wasn't supernatural, right? There was just a serial killer. That's kind of what this needs to be. But like, you know, it's the X-Files. You know, there's going to be some sort of nonsense twist with a ghost, right? <laughs> like, so, um, speaking of which, I said that I was going to tell the ending, but that's not the actual ending. Uh, the actual right. ending is the people in the bar say, well, it's been... I don't know, however many hours it suns <laughs> up. We the haven't next heard day. Him. Yeah, so they go out to check him and they find his uh, corpse lying over the grave and they're trying to figure out how he died. Yeah, they give him the old thoughts and prayers and then check him for change. <laughs> it, is, it is worth note that the sister shows up to kind of poke the, gra- the, the, the corpse with a stick 
And then she does a little bit of a an old CSI, I'll call it here. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because uh, Lee Van Cleef is suggesting, oh, well, he accidentally stabbed his coat because the knife is in his coat or his duster or whatever. And it's like, oh, well, he got so scared because he thought the ghost was actually real. So he had a heart attack when he couldn't leave the grave and he died. Yeah. And then she shows up and goes, I'm very hungover. And then she proceeds to say, like, actually, the wind was blowing to the south, just like it is now, you know, the south. But which way is my cloak blowing? Because I am wearing a cloak. See? Which is very accurate hungover talk. I mean, she is just gone. I don't know what was, say, in the alcohol, uh, but she definitely ate the worm, so to speak. So after all that nonsense, and it is, by the by, a lot of nonsense, she goes, actually, the wind was blowing the other direction. Uh, He couldn't possibly have stabbed his own coat, even though that's kind of what we saw happen. And that's where it ends. Let's go ahead and be honest here. Well, at least I'll be honest. This episode wasn't that great. It was weird. It was definitely one of the the ones that feel not like a Twilight Zone episode compared to the others we've done. Um, Yeah, I I, I don't know. I don't know. Well, I thought it was spooky in parts. Yeah, that's fine, man. I mean, clearly you weren't the only one who thinks so. Um, but I will give, uh, the final synopsis really quick. Uh, final comment. You take this with a grain of salt or a shovel full of earth as shadow or substance. We leave it up to you. And for any further research, check under G for ghosts in the twilight zone. I like the, uh, X-Files filing system at the end. That totally leads to the X-Files theme. Yes. I, I bet you. That's what they told them. Like, all right, you can make your own X Files. Or, hey, you there, boy, who's making us our X Files theme? Uh, make us the Twilight Zone, but not. And you have ten notes to do it in. Do 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 do. do. Sorry, twelve notes. <laughs> oh well, you can tell that theme was written during a hot boxing session in oh. New Mexico somewhere. Oh man, I love I. The X-Files theme is an all-timer. A very young Chris Carter and a very old Rod Serling in New Mexico. Hot boxing. Spit, splitting two uh, cases of cigarettes. <laughs> I don't think I ever, Serling... I ever called a really show called Millennium. Bad. No, that's your, that's your second one. Start out with the first one. Uh, anyway, let's jump over to the next one. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound. A dimension of sight. A dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Welcome back. I've been preparing myself for the last 20 minutes. <laughs> this one uh, has like the longest introduction of any episode we've done. <laughs> and since I'm going to read it, I guess I should. Uh, I got to be prepared. As I've been mentioning before, uh, this is a, before I get too far, this is It's a Good Life by the Twilight Zone. Uh, this is episode eight. And this is the one that I'm sure if you haven't seen it before, you've seen it before. Um, but... <laughs> We always play the game of, hey, where's Rod Sterling going to come out of? And generally it's like, I'm behind this column watching you eat birthday cake. Or I'm using your toilet without flushing. Uh, but this time we start with him in front of a map like he's looking for Carmen San Diego. <laughs> um, oh, that would have been and- interesting. Uh, Rod Serling as the host of a Carmen San Diego game. Picture a woman wearing all red and stealing the Eiffel Tower. This week, you, in the audience, are going to help us find her. Because where in the world is Carmen San Diego? You know what? I'd have watched that. Mm. I would have, too. Just him with a cigarette being passive-aggressive towards the the kids running around. Now, Timmy, (laughs) if there was intrigue in Edinburgh, 
Where would that intrigue be? Not in Nebraska, Billy. Anyway, so let me see if I can do this. Tonight's story on the Twilight Zone is someone unique and requires a different kind of introduction. This, as you may recognize, is a map of the United States. And there's a little town here called Peaksville. On a given morning not too long ago, the rest of the world disappeared and Peaksville was left all alone. Its inhabitants were never sure whether the world was destroyed and only Peaksville left untouched, or whether the village had somehow just been taken away. They were, on the other hand, sure of one thing, the cause. A monster had arrived in the village. Just by using his mind, he took away the automobiles, electricity, the machines, because they displeased him. And he moved an entire community back to the Dark Ages, just by using his mind. Now, I'd like to introduce you to some of the people from Peaksville, Ohio. This is Mr. Friedman. It's his farmhouse that the monster resides. This is Mrs. Fremont. And this is Aunt Amy, who probably had more control over the monster in the beginning than almost anyone. But one day she forgot. She began to sing aloud. Now, the monster doesn't like singing. So his mind snapped at her, turned her into the sniveling, vacant thing you're looking at now. She sings no more. And you'll note that the people of Peaksville have to smile. They have to think happy thoughts and say happy things because once displeased, the monster can wish them into a cornfield or change them into a grotesque walking horror. This particular monster can read minds, you see. He knows every thought. He can feel every emotion. Oh yes, I did forget something, didn't I? I forgot to introduce you to the monster. This is the monster. His name is Anthony Fremont. He's six years old, with a cute little boy face, blue, guileless eyes. But when those eyes look at you, you'd better start thinking happy thoughts, because the mind behind them is absolutely in charge. This is the Twilight Zone. I mean, my God, how great well, is I'm that? I'm hard as a rock right now. I was going to say, how good is that? His his things are usually, what, three sentences, four sentences? This one is three times longer than that, but every word matters. This is A, high-quality writing, and B, can you tell we're in the competent hands of Rod Serling again? He wrote this episode, and it's mon- it's phenomenal. Well, this is something we don't reference a lot about this, is that these are all based on short stories that were like being in the uh, sci-fi pulp magazines back in the day. And this one was uh, written by uh, Jerome Bixby. He wrote us uh, the Star Trek episode Mirror Mirror. Yeah, uh, the, one the, the goatees where they meet their twins. And another thing that he did that some people might recognize from the past couple of decades was The Man from Earth. Did you ever see that? Oh, of course. It's great. Yeah, yeah, that was him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and if I recall, and it's been a while, uh, but he also invented one of my favorite sci-fi cliches, which is Fantastic Voyage. Yes, he did. Uh, where, you know, you shrink people down for, um, you know, medical reasons to, I think in the original, it's like there's an injured, like a brilliant scientist with like an injury in his brain of some sort. I don't remember if it's a tumor or like just a tear and we're trying to save him. That's what Fantastic Voyage is. And so you've seen it a million times of like Simpsons, Rick and Morty, like everyone does the thing where you shrink down to save someone. We're talking sci-fi royalty. This is like Philip K. Dick nonsense, right? Like the, this guy mm-hmm. or uh, William Gibson nonsense. Uh, he kind of set up like the world. But luckily for us, they just didn't want to have a religion. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, the uh, anyway, thing... um, so I think Matt gave us our last synopses. So, Daniel, you want to tell us what this episode's about, other than my 25-minute long introduction? Uh, there's this little six-year-old child who has godlike powers to just basically reshape the world to his whim. The thing that I think most people miss is that he's not malevolent. He's just a normal kid and doesn't know any better. But anyway, throughout the entire thing, all the remaining townsfolk in Peaksville are all pretending like they're all happy with their thing. It's like, oh, well, it's such a good day and there's such good weather. And I saw 
Anthony making a three-headed gopher. And I'm sure glad he did that. Dude, let's talk about that introduction. And it's so funny because, like, the dude super overdoes it. It's so funny now, of course, the whole reference is that, oh, dude, what's that movie uh, right now? You should have left. Okay, well, I'm I'm not going to pretend like uh, I've seen it other than... um, you know, the trailer, which is everywhere now. But it's the male lead is Kevin Bacon, everyone's favorite person who's apparently met everyone ever. Uh, mm-hmm. He's married. Uh, his name is You Should Have Left uh, or whatever. It's a David Kep film. So this will tell Daniel already all he needs to know. Uh, but I'm he looking plays up now and it's well, I was going to say Bacon like he's married to Amanda Seyfried. The age thing there is terrifying. Amanda Seyfried is literally my age. Uh, actually, she's younger than me. She was born the same year I was, 1985. Kevin Bacon was born in 1958, I think. Um, oh, good lord. That's when my dad was born. But that's the thing. In the Twilight Zone episode, the reason I brought that up was, in It's a Good Life, we're introduced to the happy-go-lucky delivery boy, who's a like a, a young, plucky 45-year-old man in this <laughs> he's like all sweating he's like it's a good thing that anthony did that and you're just like you are terrified like you're a 16 year old boy on his first date and it's oh jeez, it's a good oh, thing what? that anthony did that oh jeez. <laughs> well, what do you got what? there anthony it's a gopher with three heads the first time i saw this i don't think i really got it when i first saw it i assumed it was a uh spoof about stalinist russia about how the kids were turning in their parents for criticizing the government which is where uh the thought crime idea in 1984 came from i don't think that's it in retrospect it's really just about people who are scared of their kids if anyone's over the top it's because it's because that's what the child would understand you have to constantly say oh it's real good because they wouldn't pick up on any subtleties. Yeah, you just give a... He's supposed to be what I think I said in the intro, six. My wife's first response was, oh, I would have been sent to the cornfield so quickly. Also, we're, we're clear on this. Cornfield equals death, right? Because none of the people ever come back from the cornfield. Yeah, it's, it's something like inexplicable. Because, again, we never see anyone ever make it back. So that's my assumption. In the context um, of this oh, episode, I think that's fair. Book. Like, there's two people of mentioning in this. Uh, Bill Mummy, who plays the kid, who plays Anthony, who was the same kid from two weeks ago? Uh, no, last week. Uh, the grandma phone. Yep. Uh, he, he's the one who gets the banana phone that reaches grandma. And I think he was um, Will Robinson as well. That's correct. Yes, he was. And he's good in this. Like, I mean, as good as a kid actor from the 60s who probably, I say in this instance, um, give a lot of credit to Macaulay Culkin because he took a lot of raps and has reformed child labor laws for actors in our in our uh, generation. Oh, good Lord. I'm just glad that Macaulay Culkin couldn't wish people into the cornfield. <laughs> I mean, because his parents would have been shot into the sun. Up with oh, nuclear yeah. man. Um, but I just hope Bill Mummy's okay. I mean, if you know him, don't send him this episode, but just, you know, let us know. He seems like, like he's doing okay. He's yeah, apparently an Emmy nominated musician now. Yeah, good I for mean, him. Yeah, he's alive. With, That's which, good. ironically, considering how much he hates singing in the show. How old is he? Wait, what was he born? 60, so he when he was 66. two and a half. He, when he was two and a half, he played Kidnapped Boy. So his kids just like email, like mailed him somewhere, and he just made money until he was old enough to stop acting. And he like, played like eight different musical instruments. Apparently, he's in the uh, Netflix revival of Lost in Space as Doctor Smith. Good. So twenty percent less rapey. He also appeared in the <laughs> Twilight Zone movie. Um, which yep, he sure did. Guys, let me know. He was... Daniel and I have been arguing about this forever if we should do this. If you really want us to do the Twilight Zone Zone as a movie, we could do it, but I just, I can't. You tell us. Well, tell I mean, us. you don't want to see Dan Aykroyd and Albert Brooks just laughing it up? The problem for me is we're redoing stuff. Like, I mean, he's in the Twilight Zone movie as 
Oh no, he comes back in the revival to do It's Still a Good Life. Um Oh hey, he was at the Ren and Stiffy show in Batman, the animated series. And I think in Star I, Trek too. He was. I, I, in I the just Twilight Zone movie, they remade this episode and he appeared in like the uh opening scene of that. No, well he's also in a segment called It's a Good Life, where he plays Tim, which I think is the dad. It opens up with this school teacher going to a bar and he and this other guy are like the the regulars and there's this kid that's trying to play an arcade game and that's supposed to be Anthony in the new one and they're just laughing saying ha ha you dumb kid interesting he's fine in this Daniel do you want to give us I mean I guess you gave us the plot synopsis kind of but like the plot in and of itself and we'll get there's not really a twist at the end which I guess is the twist um but like this kid is just awful um, and again, they reference it in the intro. He can read minds, so you have to keep having these happy thoughts. And that's why the like the shell shocked uh, milk guy, you know, is just like, um, we we found soup, but there's no laundry soap. There hasn't been laundry soap for over a year. Uh, um, uh, to, but, but but you got to tell Anthony I gave him the tomato soup because he loves the tomato soup, right? It's a good thing I brought tomato soup. I'm sure he's supposed to be like, ah, shucks, G. Willikers, 16. But he's a 40-year-old man having a nervous breakdown. And it's very unsettling. You're not wrong. Although I think the more unsettling scenes come with the parents because they're equally as terrified of him. Right after that, there's that scene where uh, Anthony's wondering why no kids are coming to play with him. And they're like, well, it's because you wish them all into the cornfield. Yeah, the, the dad doesn't like stand up to him but it's like how do i explain to a monster why these things are happening and he has this stilted way of talking and it's funny because again i I don't know how to put this daniel maybe you can help me but like in the 60s if you were paying like unless you were playing a fey character all these dudes had been through war like this is the era where like the the strong man the 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 second to last boss before you fought the mafiosi was a dude my height who weighed 50 pounds more than me like so the dad is this like steak and eggs motherfucker who like square jawed like his head is like a tin can built like a brick shit house afraid of this six-year-old like i don't know who you like like to cast it now, his uncle, the one who has like the drunken breakdown at the end, has to be Dave Batista. Like in the 1960s, this guy was like square jawed, big head, barrel chested, looked like his breakfast that morning had involved at least three different kind of animals, and then he worked 12 hours on the factory line. That's why if it's you, so. Uh, really want to picture this guy? He was the uh, police chief in the first Dirty Harry movie. Exactly. And so that's why it's all the more impressive, all the more intimidating when this like toe headed Dennis the Methus motherfucker terrifies the shit out of him. Because again, this dude with just one hand could throw this kid over the sun, right? Like that's why this, this, you're not wrong. (laughs) If you have some sort of like milk toast nonsense, like David Schwimmer could never be the dad here because then the, the, the episode falls apart. You need, like, Chris Helmsworth's, like, grandfather who was still dealing with the sheep every day. Like, an angry man who was a big-chested dude. And that's now, why you this mentioned works. you Go. mentioned uh, Dave Batista earlier. I think that'd be more appropriate as Dan. Not only mm. because, hey, I like to project. But uh, oh, Dan, right. the whole climax is around his surprise birthday party. I mean, the scene that, of course, sells this is not the three-headed whatever. It's that, like, they get TV one night a week because of whatever this kid can do with his brain hole. But (laughs) the dad comes home from working the fields and is changing for the surprise party. And so he's got this old worn wife beater on. And he's, like, putting on a work shirt, you know, like a nice dress shirt and a tie so that he can do this birthday party. And Anthony goes... There's uh, Billy Soames' dog or whatever. It's something Soames. It's a it's a collie. Oh, right. The Border Collie. And he goes, that dog never liked me. Dogs just don't like me. And you hear the dog barking. And then the dog starts whimpering. And then he goes, 
Now, son, did you send that dog to the cornfield? And he goes, no. And he goes, oh, it's a good thing you did that to that dog. And you're just like, holy shit, that kid just killed another dog. Because he goes, there's no dogs left in the neighborhood. You've smoten all the dogs or whatever you said. You've sent them all away. There's that scene even earlier where uh, after the they see the three-headed gopher, which the audience doesn't, he's like, I'm bored with the three-headed gopher. Be dead, gopher. There you go. It apparently dies. I mean, again, bone chilling. It, it, like, there's not enough words to really put this down. But, like, this is like... this. The thing is, too, I don't know who wrote this episode. I mean, I know Rod Serling wrote this, but... If the the director must have had kids, um, and so he had to really quickly teach a Bill Mummy what it was like to be a, a human child, but like this is he delivers it like a kid would. He goes, "The dog is gone now." And you're just like, whoa, 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 "What?" He goes, "I made him disappear," and you just and you see on the dad's face like, "Oh, Bill Soames' wife died years ago. This was his only companion. Uh, it's it, it's good. Like the color drains from the old man's face, right? Like and this, this is, is in just black and white, so that means right. a lot. And again, like I don't know if you boys have listened, but for those of you in the audience who have listened to the one I did with Ben Wooster, we got into this whole thing. Like the color being only black and white makes it so much starker. You know what thematically this reminds me of is uh, Frankenstein, like the actual book. Because that's all about Mary Shelley being afraid of having kids. Which, no. like in this story, the offspring ends up destroying the creators. Totally. Yeah, I mean, and, and on top of that, there's no one who wants control, uh, which is the finale, which is what's truly bone-chilling. Because, like, yesterday when I was watching this and I was, like, in my den, this completely overwhelmed my chamomile. Uh, but I was getting all I was getting all steamed. I was like... The dude who's dying is right. Do something. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that kid's got to sleep at some point. Yeah. Totally. Does he? But, I mean, also, yeah. We don't know the rules of this, other than he can only focus on one person at a time. Um, or does anyone have a gun? You could snipe him. No, I'm sure he wished all the guns away. Yeah. Or... I, I'm pretty I sure just, they said that at one point do. in this episode. I mean, and again, even if not, we just end up with something like a version of the happening where he just, you see a dude with a gun and he points the gun slowly at Anthony and then the gun turns towards his own face and he, 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 he right? Like, no, 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 no. Matt, I think, brought this up. Uh, Nick, have you seen the sequel? It's still a good life? Yeah. A million years ago. But yes, I have. That actually makes this episode better because it kind of closes the whole story and the whole arc with Anthony. I mean, after this, there's just no hope. That one at least gives audiences some hope. It does. And it's a been a lot. while since I've seen it. I need to rewatch it. Uh, I guess, I guess, I guess we should get there because um, we're not even close. Happy to help us get to the third act. Do it. In the Fremont's house, they're holding a surprise birthday party for their friend Dan, who I I don't remember how they're related to him. Or I, I oh, assume he's just, just a family buddy. friend. Just a friend. That's what I thought. But uh, throughout the entire thing, they're still trying to pay attention to Anthony. Like, there's this guy at the piano playing. And he's like, it would be good if you tell me what to play. Dan gets two things as gifts. Uh, one of them is a Perry Como record. Which he's not and the other play. is a bottle of whiskey, I think. One of five left in town. Well, I, I had and a problem with that, but we can get into it in a minute. From there, it devolves very quickly because Dan gets drunk and tells Anthony exactly what he thinks of him. Yeah, so it's a Perry Como, and you know Perry Como. You've heard, <laughs> you've been alive during a Christmas season in America. You've heard Perry Como, but oh boy. Um, he just like, look, look, we can play this until the singing starts. And he goes, mm. and the parents like, but you don't know where the singing starts. It could happen. And, and then you'd have to stop it. And you wouldn't know when the singing starts. And he goes, well, I just, I'm going to get drunk on my birthday. That scene is a whole lot funnier now than it probably was back in the day. Because I mean, Perry Coma was still somewhat a big deal back when this episode was made. Uh, 
Mr. Relaxation for the SCTV fans. Sure. But these days, they could have had that same bit and it would have worked because Perry Comb is just so out of touch. He is just not something that matters anymore. So for a guy to be excited to get a Perry Como album on his birthday in this universe, that says a lot about them. I will say, though, to your point, it's someone written as like a parent of a kid because it's also like, I don't want him to play with his new toy. I want to keep playing with my toys. I want to watch the movie and listen to the music that I like, not you, right? And that's kind of what it is, and it's very chilling um but then he's like well if i can't listen to my music which is something i've wanted to do forever because i miss perry como or whatever um i'm just going to get the drunkest that has ever been drunk and this guy starts going through that bottle of brandy uh it's specifically they say peach schnapps and that's why i said whoa daniel because they say (laughs) because you're right he goes we have five bottles of liquor left in this town one bottle, or sorry, five bottles of liquor. He goes like one bottle of scotch, two bottles of bourbon, one bottle of whiskey, and one bottle of schnapps. All the whiskey we have left. And I'm like, none of that made any sense. And But this dude not only pounds it, but then he throws it in the fireplace. And he goes, I have a request for you. Sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to me. And everyone's like, like, like everyone gets the most fantastic kind of chill up their little spines that I've seen in a while. You were talking about casting. I would have loved for this guy, if it were remade today, to be Dan Bautista. The guy whose birthday it was? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because, like, but that's what it is. Because, like, because he does give, like, this impassioned, like... Or, I mean, again, this is not now. This was actually in between now and when this came out, maybe mid to late 70s. But if it was like a mid to late 70s Charlton Heston talking like, don't you understand? We've got to stand up to this guy. Like, I I just want someone with like 20% more grizzle in his teeth. But like when he is like pure on shit hammered, he goes, look, he's going to send me away. He's going to destroy me. He's focused on me, though. Someone do something. Anyone help me. He says, look, there's a, whatever, a fireplace poker there. There's a lamp, a bottle, grab anything. And so, like, to you, Daniel, this is what made me think of Stalin's pogroms or Hitler or whatever, because everyone was so on board with this, like, little person with power that they didn't stand up, even though they knew what was right. That's where I feel it. Although I will agree with you, this is clearly written by someone who, or for those of you who are upset at me, Rob Sterling. This is clearly written by Rob Sterling, um, who had kids at this point, I guess. I don't know, but he knows how to write for a parent who's afraid. (laughs) Right? Did Rob Sterling have any kids? No idea. I think he had at least two. Yeah, Marlboro and Jack. What do you think about all this, Matt? It feels like we've been a while since we've heard from you. Well, I, I knew I knew quite a bit about this episode going in, thanks to, among other things, The Simpsons. Mm. So this episode was not very surprising. So if I if so if you have not seen this episode before and are not really aware of it, you might enjoy it more than I did. That might be one reason I like The Grave better, but we'll get to that later. Well, I mean, and or, uh, I mean, essentially Stephen King stole this for Children's of the Corn, uh, which is very similar. Okay, Outlander. Um, I guess, right? Brightburn just came out last year, and it's kind of the same thing. Parents being afraid of their strange child. That's the Rod Serling, you know, like perfection. What we need to give credit to is what Daniel alluded to. He's a good sci-fi person because he must have read, you know, he's, he's like Jon Stewart or something. He read every book that came across his desk. Like he must've been reading 200 pages an hour. Like I, I I can't, if I feel like doing like he, he must've read a thousand books a year. A bunch of his stuff does come from short stories. A bunch of the stuff that he comes up with himself is inspired by short stories. I imagine this is kind of that. I think there actually is a short story or a novella called It's a Good Life. That's what there is. Jerome Bixby. We, yeah, we 
covered that at the beginning. Again, I think the Jerome Bixby piece came out like 12 years before or something, you know, a decade before. And Serling files this away. Like he, if you're going to run a sci-fi show like this, like if you're Chris Carter doing the X-Files, you you know all the cryptids, right? If you're doing this and you're 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 him, you do everything. And maybe to me, that's why the newer Twilight Zones just don't work. Because they're just like, well, what if we rewatch the old show and make new versions of that? Well, that's fine and all. But Rod Serling clearly read 2,000 stories, threw out more than half of them, and then said maybe these 500 can be something. And then spread them out over the two and a half shows that he did. Because this probably was a good short story based on the guy's pedigree, but he also turned it into a 24 minute something, which is a very hard thing to do. And that's why you can tell when Rod Serling wants to do it, he like kind of, you know, licks his lips and makes a perfect sandwich. This is a perfect episode in a lot of ways. I guess I can give the finale kind of the ending closing narration here. Well, there's two things that happens before then. First, as Matt alluded to, this was remade into a Simpsons episode where Homer gets turned into a jack-in-the-box, which is the ending here. But instead of interacting with... Wasn't there a scene in that where uh, Homer, as jack-in-the-box, tries to catch a foul ball, but because he has no arms, it just hits his head? Prop. That sounds very Simpsonian if you have him hit in the head. That doesn't no. happen here. But they do turn just, someone into a jack-in-a-box. Yes, they do. Uh, yeah. Anthony turns Dan into a jack-in-the-box, and all the adults are so horrified, they beg Anthony to wish Dan away, which he does. Well, that's why I think it's a death instead of just going somewhere, because he's in such torturous pain. Send him away, right? It's like telling uh, you know, like a kid that we sent the dog to a farm upstate, that he's literally <laughs> just killing these people one by one, which is also horrifying. But it's why Dan's final plea is so important. He's like, look, someone has to do something because there's almost none of us left. And then they watch him tear this man apart. Again, you speak out against the Nazis, the, the communists, whoever, and you get torn apart. You, you, you get made a clown of, and then you get defeated anyway. It's something. You know, that's interesting because in the sequel, Anthony's daughter can bring stuff back from the cornfield, mostly objects, but the finale of that is she brings everything back except the residents of Peaksville. By the way, do you, we didn't the mention other, this, but do you know who plays the mom? Cloris Leachman. Cloris Leachman. There we go. We have our other actress. We have someone else, which is great. And yes, uh, Cloris Leachman was once young. I mean, even in Young Frankenstein, that was the joke where she was playing the old spinster. So. And she's still alive. She's still alive. Mm. She's also in a High Anxiety and History of the World, I think. She was even the grandma in Beverly Hillbillies. Which I only mention because A, it's of course a stay tuned. B, that was 1993, so that's like 27 years ago. Um, she is 94 as yeah. of the time of this recording. Um, but anyway. But the final thing ahead. that happens in this is when uh, Anthony uh, makes it snow. Yes. And then uh, his dad's like, well, that'll kill half the crops. Why are you doing, why are you, well, it's good that you made it snow. And that's pretty much the end. Yeah, and he, he I think the last line is literally, uh, but making it snow is good, real good. And tomorrow's going to be a really good day. The thing was, Dan was right. Kill the kid. Anyone. Why I love this episode. And we'll get into which one's better. But, like, there's no resolution. As you mentioned, of course, uh, it, there's a sequel, you know, long after everyone else involved is dead. <laughs> Except for Bill Mummy, who sucked the youth out of... Well, there's no youth to suck out of him. And Cloris Leachman. Of, of Cloris. Poor Cloris. You leave it right here. And I'm just like, no comeuppance, no nothing? That's what he says. Any narration. No comment here. No. No comment at all. We wanted to introduce you to one of our very special citizens. Little Anthony Fremont, age six, who lives in a village called Peaksville in a place that used to be Ohio. And if by some strange chance you run across him, you had better think only good thoughts. Anything less than that is handled at your own risk. Because if you do meet Anthony, 
you can only be sure of one thing. You have entered the Twilight Zone. How amazing is that? Well, considering this is in Ohio, it may as well be uh, Amish country. But it's also, flipping that table around, it's also that kind of like x files thing. I swear there was a town here. No, sir, that was never a town here. Huh? Right? Like, it's just, there's just something there. Uh, no, this is a, it's a really good one because it's just got so many layers to it. Uh, like I said, I thought it was a uh, Stalinist parable, but seeing it again, I don't think that's the case. I mean, I will also say there's something that always lands about creepy kids. The problem is you have to know where their competency lies, right? That's why, say, The Omen starts out very strong. That's why Rugrats is garbage. That's why The Simpsons parody works. That's why the Stephen King stuff is kind of hit or miss. Because the, he is written like a six-year-old really would be. The thing that where the acting takes part, quote-unquote acting takes part, is how the parents react to him right if the kid was using overwhelmingly like smarty smart language it doesn't work this works because frankly it's competent in knowing how kids act and respond it's you could tell me they didn't even write the parents other than telling them the outline because all you have to do is have little anthony know what he wants and then everyone else is terrified about what he actually wants yeah you're, I mean, you've got more experience with that than <laughs> me or Matt do. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I mean, Matt as a teacher is a, probably on the same page with me. Like, it's all about the confidence of the kid. And, like, he uses his power briefly in this episode, very briefly. But it's more that he's set people up for these rules so consistently. Like, it's almost as a writing exercise, a perfect writing exercise, because you know everything about the rules of this world. The only people I'd be more interested in directing this and making this than Rod Serling is take this idea and give it to the Coen brothers, just because they know what to do with people. Like, I love them. They're one of my favorites, but they don't write scripts. They create interesting characters and see how they react. Like, th that's what this is. Interesting characters have been created. Now what the fuck happens, right? This I'm is just so picturing good. Walter as Anthony now. <laughs> oh, man. So in this version, this Coen Brothers version, who's the, the Dan at the end? Is it the dude or is it is it Walter? Is it, like Does Walter oh. keep a stiff lip because he's in torture, like he's been trained? Or is it like, no, man, Anthony, you can't send people to the cornfield? I imagine it's the chief nihilist, uh, Peter Samir. <sighs> We believe in nothing, Lebowski. We believe in nothing, Anthony. You don't uh, scare us, the cornfield. I will tell you this, Daniel, because I'm here and you're there. Of all things today, I got a copy of Inside Lewin Davis. It's great. It's one of my favorites. It really is of theirs. But we should wrap this up. I've even already given the final narration. So, uh, Matt, which one's your favorite of the two? I liked The Grave better because it had some moments I thought were legitimately spooky and the acting is really good. And I knew mm -hmm. too much about It's a Good Life to really be surprised by very much. Sure. Daniel? I'm not going to disagree with Matt about the acting on The Grave. The acting in the cast was great, but come on. I mean, I can't not pick It's a Good Life. That's just one of the best sci-fi stories, I think, ever. And uh, the Twilight Zone brought it to life. I'm going to say, I, I'm not going to side with Matt. But I agree with him. I hadn't seen that one before, and it's excellent, excellent, excellent acting. The fact that you have Lee Marvin and you know Van Cleef against each other, man, I, I didn't think I'd see it. I hasten to say though. I feel like the director didn't know what it was going to be because it, it did have its creepy moments, but it, they didn't, they couldn't decide if it was a drama or a horror or a comedy. Cause sometimes it was kind of funny. I just feel like it was out of place, but I do understand why they say it's an all timer. 
I will say though, I love it's a good life because I've seen everything that ripped it off. But the fact that at the end, Anthony is still in charge is like jostling. Even the Simpsons, there was some sort of resolution. There's no revolution resolution here. He's just like, no comment here at all. We just wanted to show how great the Twilight Zone can be. Fuck you. That is some like <laughs> naked ballsiness. And by the way, if you're looking at just the optics of the show for the last two and a half seasons, you've been just whipping out Rod Serling and he's come out behind columns, bathroom doors. You know, he's eating a cake in that one with a grandma effectively. And in this one, he doesn't even enter that world as though Anthony himself is so terrifying. He's like, I'm going to gesture to a vague map. This is where the troops may or not be, Geraldo. Like, that's that's some high quality nonsense. It's, it's as though, like, Rod Serling is Professor X and he has his own world of extraordinary gentlemen. I, I, I will give Matt, you know, the, the doctor the cap here in that he's right. You've seen this episode before, but I will counteract it in that, unlike some other ones like that you've quote unquote seen before, like that one I did with Ben Wooster, uh, tiny, talking t- Taki Tina, you actually, which you have seen before, like Taki Tina, the parodies are exactly that. This one you should see because... Maybe it's just a perfect picture of its time, but also the time makes it even weirder. Like there's just something about, we don't give kid actors very much credit, but Bill Mummy's pretty good in this. Also, Cloris Leachman is fantastic in this. Her husband, John Larch, is fantastic in this. And the kid wins. This isn't kid power. This is kid terror. And I'm all for it. Um, so I'm going to give it to It's a Good Life this week, but only um, because it's this. There's some other weeks where the grave would have won, but I didn't feel like writing The Haunted Mansion this week. I will say here, though, Sudsy has convinced me to uh, finish this out. We only have three episodes after this, uh, 11, 12, and 13. So thanks for listening. After that... Because by the time we get to that final episode, number 13, we're pretty much about to start season seven, which thanks to the two boyos on this podcast uh, chain with me right now, because they've been there since the beginning. We will then talk and figure out what's going to come next, because I'm almost positive we'll be back locked down before long. But in the meantime, thanks guys for listening. And... Pay attention to the corners of your room and to the dark of the clouds because you're still locked in the twilight zone. Zone. Thanks, guys. The Twilight Zone Zone is a production of Dude Letter Podcasting and Myopia Defend Your Childhood. It is hosted by Nick Hoffman, paneled by Daniel S. and Matt Quinn. It is edited by Nick and Daniel. The theme song is Six Impromptus, Opus 5, Impromptu 5 by Jean Sibelius. The list is from Vanity Fair, the 26 episodes we talk about when we talk about The Twilight Zone by Donald Liebenson. The Twilight Zone is created, hosted, and mostly written by Rod Sterling. The Twilight Zone and all clips are owned by CBS Television and Cayuga Productions.